بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to class number four of الشمائل المحمدية inshallah in today's class we will be discussing the white hair of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم along with did the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم dye his hair and then last but not least the usage of kohal or you or antimony uh, in English. So Bibnillahi Ta'ala, that is what is on, on our schedule for today. Uh, it's not going to be a very heavy class, it's actually going to be quite a, a light class. Bibnillahi Ta'ala. Now I see people coming in, Alhamdulillah. I just want to make sure that today, Bibnillahi Ta'ala, I can see your comments, inshallah. So for those of you that are watching, if you have said something, let's see if I can see your comments. Um, swipe left to reveal comments and reactions. Okay, I have done that. And bismillahi ta'ala, hopefully things will show up as we begin. Okay, so let's get into it. We have uh, quite a few hadith to go through. So we're on chapter number five tonight. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There we go. Allahu Akbar. I can see everyone tonight. So we have Hiba, wa alaikum as salam wa We have Noel, wa alaikum as salam wa We have Nahida, wa alaikum as salam wa we have Lubna, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And we have Um Qasim, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So chapter number five. Qala uh, al-mu'allifu wa rahimanallahu wa iyyah. Babu ma jaa fi shaybi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Chapter number five. Uh, what has been narrated concerning the blessed white hair of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So hadith number one, I asked Anas ibn Malik, did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dye his blessed hair? He replied, it did not reach that point. He had only a few white hair on his blessed temples. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, however, did dye his hair with henna and uh, kata. So in this first hadith, we see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not have very many white hair. In other narrations, we'll see from Anas and others that there were approximately 14 or under 20. And Anas radiallahu anhu is saying that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not have enough white hair for them to be dyed. However, however, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did dye his hair with hinna and with katam. Hinna, all of you are familiar with, you often see uh, people use it on Eid to put it on their hands and it creates that pattern on their hands with that uh, orange, red, you know, copper color uh, dye. Uh, so that's one uh, type of dye that can be used on the hair. And then the other is katam, which is a, a black dye. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't want to dye his hair completely black because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had prohibited that as we discussed yesterday. So he used to combine between henna and uh, katam to combine between uh, an orangish, blackish hue. And that is how Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to dye his hair, which also alludes to the fact that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had more white hair than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as we see in the hadith of Anas. In the next hadith, I did not count on the blessed head or beard of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except 14 white hair. And here we see Anas ibn Balik radiallahu anhu, he's meticulously counted the number of hair. Like 14 is not, you know, a, a number that you just round to that you round up or round down to 14. No, that's not how you use the number 14, but it is a very specific number. So you can imagine that he has counted meticulously and diligently the number of white hair on the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this shows us the level of preservation that they wanted to have about the details of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that no detail would go escaped. Now, obviously you'll find different narrations that talk about 14, 17, 18, 20. Is there a need for reconciliation? No, not at all. As we've been seeing throughout this series, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did different things at different times and had different features at different times. And that was just a, a natural part of progression and a natural part of aging of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the fact that Anas Sallallahu Alaihi narrates 14 over here and another companion will narrate 17 or 18 white hair uh, in another hadith, there's no contradiction there. It's just at different parts of life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in the next hadith we find, I heard Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu anhu say, when questioned about the white hair of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he would apply oil to his blessed hair, no white hair could be seen. And when he would not apply oil to his blessed hair, they could be seen. So here we see that the oil that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used on his hair 
was not a uh, translucent, transparent oil, but rather it was an oil that had color to it. So you can imagine the, you know, olive oil that we have of today, it's mainly transparent, but it is also a greenish yellow in color. So if it was to get on the white clothing, it will actually leave that yellowish green uh, hue on the cloth. And similarly, the, uh, the oil that they used at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu <clears throat> it was not completely transparent or translucent, but rather it did have color to it. So when the Prophet Sallallahu used to put this oil on, even his few white hair would seem as if they were dark in color. It would seem as if they were dark in color, even though the Prophet Sallallahu himself did not dye his hair. In the next hadith, the blessed white hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were only around 20 or so in number. The next hadith, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, O Messenger of Allah, your hair has become white. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, Hud waqi'a mursalat amma yatasa'alun and ila shamsu kuwirat have turned my hair white. In the next hadith, they said, O Messenger of Allah, we see that you have started to get white hair. He replied, Indeed, Hud and its sister's chapters have turned my hair white. So we can see that earlier on, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't have many white hair, but as he reflected more upon the Quran and he contemplated, contemplated more upon the Quran, then the number of white hair increased upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So initially, he only had white hair on his, in his temple area over here, particularly where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would split his hair in the middle. And then eventually that number grew as did the whiteness on the sides of his, uh, of his beard. And thus the number of white hair on the beard and upon the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grew. Number two, we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is highlighting the fact that it wasn't matters of this dunya that you know, caused his hair to turn white. It wasn't that you know he lived a, a difficult life of loss. It wasn't that he struggled through poverty. It wasn't that um, you know he saw the hardships that his companions went through. But rather, it was the Quran and his reflection upon the Quran. And then even deeper than that, it was the people that heard the message of Islam not accepting it that caused him this anxiety and this stress. So now let's look at the surahs that are actually mentioned. So the first uh, hadith explicitly mentions Hud waqi'a mursalat amma yatasa'alun and ila shamsu kuwirat. These are the five that are mentioned here. In another hadith, and this is the more predominant one, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refers to Hud wa akhawatuha, that uh, the um, chapter of Hud and its sisters. Now, what does its sisters actually consist of, there's actually a difference of opinion. And then also there are various other hadith that talk about, um, you know, similar topics. So let's see what the scholars mention. So we have Surah Hud, that is the consistent uh, reoccurring in all of them. We have Surah Waqi'ah, we have Surah Mursalat, we have Surah Amma Yatasa'alun, we have Ila Shamsu Kuwirat, al haqqa al ghashiyah al Ma'arij, al Qamar, in Shikak, in Fitar, and Qariya. These are the 12 surahs that are mentioned in the various surahs. So these 12 surahs, what are the underlying themes that you're going to find in them? The underlying themes are the events of the hereafter and then also denial of Islam. So events of the hereafter and denial of Islam. These are, these are the two main reoccurring themes uh, of these surahs. And these heavily weighed down upon the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam and it, it just pained him that people would recognize the truth, but they would not accept it for one reason or another. And this turned the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam white due to the anxiety and stress that he felt. So what's interesting over here is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is referring to a physical phenomenon here, that how stress and anxiety can have an impact on your physical state. That the more stress and anxiety that you have, then the more white hair you will have as well. But for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it wasn't matters of this dunya, it was matters of the Akhirah and upon contemplating the Quran. And this shows that when you deeply contemplate the Quran, it will even have a physical impact on your life. It will even have a physical impact on your life. You know, the joke uh, amongst Imams is that um, if you want to grow old quickly, become an Imam. If you want to grow white hair quickly, become an Imam. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and make things easy for us.
Okay, the next hadith. I came to the Prophet وسلم, while one of my sons was with me. I was shown the Prophet and when I saw him, I said to myself, this is the Prophet of Allah. He was wearing two green garments and he had some hairs that had turned white but were red. He had some hair that were uh, had turned white but were red. So now here we see uh, a couple of points. That number one, uh, Abu Rimtha Taymi, um, he brought his son with him. And this is a, you know, a piece of advice that when you're thinking of where to bring your children and what type of activities to bring your children to, you know, bringing them to scholars and bringing them to the masajid and bringing them to halaqat and to gatherings and to conferences is a great thing. Is a great thing. And we see that this is something that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ did. And this instilled uh, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, love of the Messenger of Allah, love of the, of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you can do that from a young age, inshallah, hopefully it'll have a positive impact on their life. Number two, he was wearing two green garments. And as we mentioned previously, the Prophet ﷺ would frequently wear two green garments. The upper garment known as the Rida and the lower garment as the Izar. And the fact that it is green over here, it is highlighted um, either because it had green stripes or because it was uh, predominantly green. It was predominantly green, showing us the permissibility of wearing that color and how it was a color that was um, socially acceptable at that time. So as we know, the Prophet wasallam gave uh, disliked prohibitions for red and for yellow, but he was seen wearing green. He was seen wearing green. So it shows the social acceptability uh, of the wearing of the color of green. In other narrations, we have that green was the favorite color of the Prophet wasallam, and the favorite type of clothing was the white striped clothing. The favorite type of clothing was the white striped clothing, and that's coming up in the future chapter, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. So this hadith specifically mentions that the Prophet wasallam had a few white hair, uh, but they were seen to be red. They were seen to be red. Now, again, how are they turning red? This is going to be coming up in the next chapter. But scholars mention that the reconciliation between the hadith of Anas, that he had such few hair that he did not need to dye, and the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, that he did dye his hair, is to show that perhaps the Prophet wasallam used a colored oil or a colored perfume that would make his hair seemed, seem colored, but in reality, they were not dyed. In reality, they were not dyed. Jabir ibn Samara radiallahu anhu was asked, did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa have any white hair on his head? And he replied, the Messenger of Allah did not have any white hair on his blessed heads, except for a few strands in the middle where it would be parted. And if he applied oil to his blessed head, the oil would conceal them. So this shows us um, in chapter number five, the conclusion of chapter number five, uh, the number of white hair the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had and why it was caused. Now, there are other hadith that the Prophet وسلم, refers to white hair as a light and as a sign of uh, nobility. And that is why one should not pluck white hair. And this is something to, to emphasize again, that if you do have white hair, do not pluck them as the Prophet وسلم, discouraged that. The Prophet وسلم, discouraged the plucking of white hair. So now we get to chapter number six, which is concerning dyeing one's hair. Are you allowed to dye your hair? We learned in the previous chapter that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did dye his hair a combination between orange and black. And in this chapter, we'll learn did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa himself dye his hair? So Abu Rimtha, and this is a continuation from the previous hadith. Um, Abu Rimtha reported, I came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with one of my sons and he asked, is this your son? I replied, yes, I acknowledge him. So he said, you will not be held accountable for his crime nor will he be held accountable for your crime. I saw some white hairs that had been dyed red. So to understand context of this hadith, prior to Islam, if any one of your family members had committed a crime, then the whole family and the tribe is responsible for compensation and for expiation um, and for any payments and accountability that needs to be made. But once Islam comes about, then no other individual is responsible for the crimes of another, nor accountable, nor held responsible. So here the Prophet وسلم, is explaining here that with the coming of Islam, any crimes that your children or your ancestors have committed, you are no longer responsible for. And this hadith highlights the fact at the end that he did have a few white hair, 
which were dyed red. So now we're starting to see a difference of opinion even amongst the companions. So Anas radiallahu anhu clearly said he did not have enough white hairs that needed to be dyed and he never dyed his white hair. And here we have Abu Rimtha with the first hadith saying that he did dye his hair red. In the next hadith, Abu Huraira uh, radiallahu anhu was asked, did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam use dye? So you can see a very explicit hadith and he radiallahu anhu responded, yes. Then in the next hadith, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leave his home while shaking water from his blessed head, having had just taken a bath and on his blessed head were traces of hinna dye. Were traces of hinna dye. So here is another hadith explicitly stating that there were traces of hinna dye upon the head of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the last hadith of the chapter, I saw the blessed hadith, uh, hair of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it was dyed. Hamad said, Abdullah bin Muhammad ibn Aqil related to us, I saw the blessed hair of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Anas ibn Malik and it was dyed. Now, here's what I love about uh, Islam and the studying of Islamic sciences. Because you're going to get um, quite a few narrations that are seemingly at opposition with one another. And from the beauty of Islam and scholarship is you see how scholars reconciled them. So you have Anas radiallahu anhu clearly stating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not dye his hair. And here Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is asked, did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa dye his hair? And he says, yes. So now, what did the scholars of Islam say about these various hadith? Number one is timing. They said that there was a time where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa dyed his hair and then he stopped. There was a time where he dyed his hair and then he stopped. So that is one opinion. Opinion number two is that in fact the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't dye his hair, but rather any color that was seen was seen color from oil or from perfume. Number three is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did use henna on his hair, but not as a dye, but rather for medicinal purposes and for cooling properties. So at that time, henna was used upon one's hair for its medicinal properties, but also for keeping the head cool. So if you had henna on your hair and um, you, uh, you were walking out in the sun, that part that bits put on, you, on your head that is covered with henna, it keeps the, the head cool, it keeps the head cool. So these are three different ways that scholars reconciled these different narrations. These are three different ways the scholars reconciled these narrations. And this is from the beauty of our scholarship. Alhamdulillah, that's something that I, I've really come to appreciate while studying the shamail of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now we get to the last chapter, which is the kuhul or antimony that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to use. So for those of you that are not familiar, I want you to think of uh, a medicinal mascara. This is exactly what it is. It is a medicinal mascara. Now, when you think of mascara in our day and age, you would think of it as a very feminine product, the way that perhaps it uh, elongates your eyelashes and makes your eyes look wider. You would think of it as a very feminine product. And this is the same thing I want to highlight again, that previously when we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu having braids and plaited his hair, it was perfectly fine. It was not considered feminine, but rather the Prophet Sallallahu him himself was the epitome of masculinity. So this shows us that over time, that which is socially acceptable and that which is socially masculine and socially feminine also changes in interpretation, also changes in interpretation. And that is why you'll see that the different schools of thoughts had a different opinions on this matter. So particularly Imam Malik rahimahullah, uh, from what I understand, he discouraged the usage of kohal during the daytime for men, but he said it was fine to use it at night, and especially if it was for medicinal purposes. Why? Because at nighttime you're at home, no one else can see it, and thus it doesn't make the eyes look feminine. And that was his reasoning behind it. Whereas other scholars that said, no, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly used it during the daytime, and it is perfectly fine to do so, and it is not considered feminine at all. So let's look at the various hadith pertaining to kohal. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu related that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, apply ithmid, for it strengthens the eyesight and boosts the growth of eyelashes. He, Ibn Abbas, said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had a kohal container from which he would apply kohal each night, thrice in this one and thrice 
in this one. So this hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas عنهما, very explicit that the Prophet وسلم, would apply a kohol known as ithmid. So kohol, I want you to imagine, is that type of mascara. And I'm using that term mascara very loosely. The word is antimony, but if I use antimony, not very many people are going to be familiar with it. So you can imagine it is a type of mascara. And from the types of mascara, there's one in particular that is known as ithmid. There's one in particular that is known as ithmid. And this is the one that the Prophet وسلم, is praising for two properties. Number one, it strengthens the eyesight. And number two, it uh, elongates the eyelashes. And the elongating of the eyelashes, it'll protect uh, stuff, if, you know, dust from going into the eye. But also, uh, it is a sign of beauty as well. It is a sign of beauty as well. What's really interesting, for those of you that may remember, I'm uh, reading from this book over here called the Shemail al muhammadiyya printed by uh, Imam al-Ghazali print, uh, or publishing rather. And they have a very interesting footnote that I want to share with you. Because I know some people, when they go to Medina, they like to buy kohal and like to buy that uh, antimony that the Prophet Wasallam used to use. But they mention over here that the antimony that is uh, available today is very different. So they say that this is addressed to those with healthy eyesight. For those suffering with ailments, the use of ithmid is harmful. Ithmid is the well-known mineral used as an antimony. Its mines are found in the east and its color is reddish black. In today's time, those who wish to use kohol, uh, whether ithmid or otherwise, must exercise caution, since much of the kohol available in the markets is contaminated with heavy metals. Long-term exposure to heavy metals can cause neurological, respiratory, and cardiovascular disorders, imbalance of hormones, hair loss, infertility, and other ailments. So this shows us that just because something is labeled sunnah, you have to be careful of using it in this modern day and age because you know perhaps you may be using it in uh, appropriately or it's not the actual product. So the kohol that is available nowadays in the marketplaces in Medina, um, that is not actually good quality kohol. And that may actually do more damage to your eyes than actually help it. So you want to find the pure sources of kohol that yes, will be more expensive, but at least they will have those medicinal properties that the Prophet ﷺ was referring to. And you know, for me personally, I remember when I was in uh, visiting Medina in the recent years, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up the doors for Makkah and Medina again for us to visit uh, and makes it easy for us to travel there. I mean, I would always reach out to Sheikh Hasib Noor. Uh, and Sheikh Hasib Noor, mashallah, man, he was the guy with the hookups uh, for that stuff. So he knew where to get the pure kohal from. It would cost like 50 to 100 riyals, but you could tell it was good quality stuff away from these metals. So if you ever are in Medina and Sheikh Hasib Noor is there, reach out to him and he can definitely help you uh, find the good stuff. And if you're looking for good Aitar, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Mania was the guy where uh, he had this uh, Syrian friend of his, Sheikh Abdul Abbas, that used to make these uh, perfumes in his house, Allahu Akbar. And he was like a, a perfume connoisseur, absolutely amazing. Like SubhanAllah, you could smell the, the fragrance of perfume from his uh, apartment door and while the door was closed, it was just truly amazing. So I have those very found memories uh, of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and protect them. So yes, now back to the kohal. Make sure if you do go, you get the pure stuff. Don't get the cheap market stuff that is available. The next hadith, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would apply ithmid thrice uh, in each eye before going to sleep. So this was a part of the previous hadith as well. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to apply the kohal before going to sleep three times in this eye, three times in this eye. The, the scholars mentioned both ways are, are permitted where you can do the right eye three times first and then the left eye three times or you can do one in the right eye and then one in the left eye, then the second one in the right eye, second one in the left eye, third one in the right eye, third one in the left eye. All of these are acceptable, but we do begin with the right eye because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began with the right. And then these hadith specifically mention that he would put it on before he goes to sleep. The next hadith, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, apply ithmid when going to sleep for it strengthens the eyesight and boosts the growth of eyelashes. The next hadith, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best of your kohol is ithmid, it strengthens the eyesight and boosts the growth of eyelashes. And then last hadith, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, apply ithmid for it strengthens the eyesight and boosts the growth of eyelashes. And that is the end of chapter number seven.
So what we learn from chapter number seven is that the Prophet ﷺ did recommend the using of kohal, the antimony that is put in one's eyes, uh, particularly before one goes to bed. So before you go to bed, you put it on three times in each eye. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us a reasoning behind this that number one, it strengthens one eyesight and number two, it beautifies the eyelashes, which shows us that everything that the Prophet ﷺ recommended, there was a wisdom and a reasoning behind it. And for us as believers, it is a very good habit for us to try to understand what the wisdom and reasoning behind legislation actually is. Because you can imagine if you're given a, a commandment, do this or a prohibition, don't do that, but you don't know the wisdom or reasoning, what is the likelihood that you're going to abide by it and stick to it and it will be continuously passed down? Whereas when you have the, uh, the wisdom and the reasoning, and I'm sorry, I'm laughing, but my son is actually banging on at the door. He wants to come in. <laughs> so, you know, it, every day is a struggle with him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Um, so what I was saying is that it's important to understand the wisdom and the reasoning behind legislation so that you can better uh, implement it in your own life and remember it, and then also passing it down to future generations makes more sense. We live in a day and age where people are skeptical, right? They are more skeptical than ever before. So you have to understand the reasoning behind legislation. Now also, with this note, understand that there are certain things that are beyond our comprehension. And there's reasoning that is purely ta'abudi, purely for the sake of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have that beautiful narration of Ali radiallahu anhu, where he says that if... Um, faith was purely based upon logic, then we would be wiping the bottom of our feet and not the top of them. So you know when you make mash, you can imagine if this is the foot, when you make mash, you make mash on top of your sock over here, as opposed to the bottom, even though all of the dirt is all on the bottom. So why is it that we wipe the top? And we do this because the illa is ta'abudi, meaning that it is uh, uh, the reasoning behind it is because it's a command of Allah and this is how our pious predecessors and the Prophet وسلم, taught us to do it. So the vast majority of things in our faith will have a clear, logical explanation, reasoning and wisdom behind them. But then there are all certain things, there are also certain things where we just have to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those are far and few in between. But that faith is what is required in that submission and that is why Islam is a religion of faith but also a religion of logic, one where both of them are cohesive and coherent and not in opposition to one another. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. Jazakum Allah for attending. I'm going to go scroll back up now and uh, look through comments and questions. If you have any further questions, you can ask them below as well. Because today, Alhamdulillah, I can actually read your comments and questions. So I've responded to salams, uh, those salams already. So we have Asif Asana, wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. We have Dalarina Uthman, wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have Shahnaz Kabir, wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let's see who else. We have Azim Ahmad. What did Azim Ahmad say? Assalamu alaykum, Sheikh. Thank you for the amazing series. Would it be possible to upload this series on the IISC YouTube channel as well? And the answer is yes, bithnillahi ta'ala, they will be uploaded. I know the first two episodes are already up. Inshallah, the next two episodes will also be up this week, bithnillahi ta'ala. And then anyone else? Okay, it seems that there were no more questions. So we'll conclude with that. Uh, inshallah, we'll continue next week. And next week we start with the clothing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I know clothing always leads to a very interesting discussion on the fiqh behind it. You know, silk, no silk, gold, no gold, uh, colors of clothing. Uh, do men have to keep their garments above their ankles? Um, you know, are women encouraged to keep their garments below their ankles? All those discussions we'll be having next week. Tuesday <clears throat> at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Toronto, New York, uh, Montreal. So we'll conclude with that. Abu Bakr, you're very welcome. Jahnaz, wa iyaki, my pleasure, inshallah. And I'll see you guys next week. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.